Hey, welcome to Catholic Breakfast. Taking a look at St. Augustine's amazing book, Confessions. Today we're going to look at the moment that Augustine has his conversion. So Augustine's confession is really the story of his conversion. He's confessing the glory of God, the goodness of God in his own life. And here in book eight, it's just amazing because it's like the moment. It's really this moment. But before we get to that, I want you to keep in mind that this didn't just fall out of the blue. It's a lightning bolt moment for sure in his life. And I think we need those moments in our lives, like an encounter with something so beautiful, such a manifestation of God's goodness and truth, that it just changes us. We're just different for having had those experiences. That's true for Augustine. I mean, this is massively, a massively pivotal moment in his life. Maybe the most pivotal moment in his life. There's an argument for that. Nonetheless, it's, it's a moment in a, in a whole series of moments. In fact, um, he says in uh, chapter 7 of this book that he, he reminds us that it was 12 years before when he was 19 years old that he set his mind on wisdom, to pursue wisdom. And that's going to lead him very much to be open to Christ, the incarnate wisdom of God. It's 12 years, so it's not like the next day. So it's just good to help us realize there's a certain amount of patience there. Another reason for Augustine's need for this, this drama to be spread out quite a bit is because uh, he was just very aware of his own sin and his own re rebelliousness and his own sort of addictions. In chapter 7 of book uh, 8 here, it's where Augustine says this very classic line, but I in my great worthlessness, for it was greater thus early, had begged you for chastity, saying, grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. <laughs> so conversion is about your whole life, right? It's not about just one little aspect of your life, because we're speaking about the creator God. Augustine was well aware that to cling to any created thing would jeopardize his ability to, to give his heart and soul to God completely. Uh, keep in mind, too, that in Book 7, it, it was very much a, a heady intellectual book where Augustine's wrestling with the nature of God. It's extremely important to realize that faith and, re and reason go together. To think rationally tru uh, truth about God as opposed to error about God really matters, and Augustine does that work leading up to this conversion. Don't let that make you think, so it's all about just thinking right things. Not at all, right? At the end of the day, what we're made for is to know and love God, to know and love God, not simply to know God. And so the question is, do you give your heart to, to God? We surrender to him, give your heart to him. The reason it's not easy for Augustine to just give his heart to God is because he realizes he doesn't have full control of his heart. He says, what did I not say against myself? With what lashes of condemnation did I not scourge my soul to make it follow me now that I wanted to follow you, my soul hung back. He says later, it's like this mystery of, you know, I've got this body and soul in this union, right? And, and my soul wills things and knows things. And it, it, it tells my arm, move, and my arm moves. And it tells my, 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 my soul tells my legs move and they walk. And it's like, it just happens. And my body doesn't seem to offer a whole lot of resistance. But then my mind tries to tell my mind to do something. And the mind rebels. Well, what in the world is going on with that? I mean, who in the world is in control of my mind if I'm not? Now, I guess you, you, know, you can kind of do the more modern psychological read of it where you, know, you kind of have like sort of sub-personalities or this, like, this unconscious realm. And I think in some ways Augustine kind of leads, leads up, up to that eventually. But it's just also this more basic human experience of I, the, the things that I want to give my heart to, I can't give my heart to. It's like I can't solve my problem with just willing it. I can't get a crowbar underneath my will, especially the, what it, the, the most important things are. Like, maybe I can get myself to go to the gym, but I can't pursue what's really valuable. I mean, really sp of great spiritual value in my own life. That's the kind of human problem that Augustine is struggling with. So with all that in mind, I'll fast forward to where Augustine is at his friend's house, and they're, they're in the backyard, and he's just struggling and kind of just crying out, how long, O Lord, am I going to be in this situation? He's aware that he can't solve his own problem through willpower alone or through intellectual insight alone. So then suddenly he, he hears a boy's girl, uh, he says, and suddenly I heard a voice from some nearby house, a boy's voice or a girl's voice, I do not know, but it was a sort of sing song repeated again and again, take and read, take and read, tole et lege in Latin. He, he, he ceases weeping and immediately begins to uh, search his mind carefully as to like what's going on there, like he notices it. He then says, I'm just going to like take up and read the gospel. And he reads this great line um, from when Jesus says, go and sell what you have, a gift to the poor, and then you shall have treasure in heaven and follow me. Uh, he, he was thinking of St. Anthony there who heard that line and had this huge conversion. 
Augustine's not satisfied with that, with that line from the gospel, so he takes up Paul's letter to the Romans, and he opens it up, and he reads this line. Not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering or impurities, not in contention and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in its concupiscences. He's probably heard that line a lot of times before, right? But then he says, I had no wish to read further and no need, for in that instant, with the very ending of the sentence, it was as though a light of utter confidence shone in my heart and all the darkness of uncertainty vanished away. N Notice how Augustine interprets in that moment what was going on, utter confidence shown in my heart. So first of all, confidence, it's a trust. It's a, it's a, it's a trust in, um, in God. It's like a light shining in his heart. It's, there's a kind of intellectual capacity for it, but it's also a capacity to, um, to no longer be uncertain, uh, not in some intellectual way, but in, the, in, this, like, in this very uh, loving way. He interprets it as baptism, like put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a garment analogy, right? So put on like you put on clothes. Just put it on, right? He says that's the moment he really decides to, to get baptized. So it's a concrete action, too. It's not just sort of something just in his head. It's his, it's his whole being. He's going to move into change. Here's the insight. Some of the ways you know that God is calling you is because there's a greater capacity to trust God in concrete ways. That's maybe one way to summarize how you tell the difference between like an emotional experience or just a kind of like wish or fantasy. Oh, I wish I could do this versus an authentic interior um, illumination from God where, the, where, where, where God comes to you and moves you confidence and it's a power to move and a power to act so it's concrete too it's a desire for, for relationship it's a desire to, to love God in concrete ways to surrender 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 to him Augustine knows that this is from God because it's what's happening to him is moving him to God relationship with God like love for God is like the criterion and he also knows how weak he is and he's been struggling with how, how, how impossible it is for him to move himself to God on his own uh, on his own will, his own human devices. So he's aware that this isn't coming from me. But what's amazing is he's also aware that he's free. It's as if Jesus is lending Augustine God's own will to do for Augustine and with Augustine what Augustine can't do on his own. And I think you can see that in the gratitude of Augustine. So he's just, he's going to spend a lot of the rest of the book just praising God for this grace. We might say, well, why doesn't he just acknowledge how he finally did it himself. He finally manned up and he did it himself. That's not at all what he experienced. He was way too honest with his own, his own brokenness, his own confusion, his own, frankly, his own, I don't want that. I mean, I do, but I don't. And in this, in this sheer act of grace, God moves into his heart and moves him closer to God. One way to kind of make sense out of this chapter for us personally is if you've had experiences like this with Augustine, go back to it frequently in, in your mind. Those experiences are so valuable. You know, if you haven't feel like you've had experiences like that, I think it's certainly nothing wrong with asking God for that. God, help move me. Like, Augustine was crying out to God for this experience. It's not asking for an emotional experience. It's not asking for some kind of superpower or something. What it's asking for is to love God for God to do in us and with us, in union with our human will, what we, what we can't do alone, which is, which is to love God. That's no small thing. Do you want to love God, or do you just want to like think about God, or sort of use God for your own purposes? You know, at the end of the day, what makes us happy isn't simply knowing God in some abstract way. What makes us happy is, is loving God, because when, just like Augustine, when, when we're given the grace to love God, we find that we actually are in union with Him, and possessing Him, and giving ourselves to him in concrete ways, and that's finally what makes us happy.